so Tyler and I will be live streaming at uh, Justin's Awesome, so if you can see him live stream, it would be fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so we can hang together. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Kevin. He's going to be talking about cost of data capture. So today I'm going to try to convince you all to use prop <coughs> So today I'm going to try to convince everyone to use property based testing and I'm going to explain what it is and uh, show a case study of using it with an open source compiler PFLUA which is developed by a team at Agalia where I work. So the first question is what is property based testing? Why is it worth using? <coughs> and how fast can you get started with it? And for the last one, I'm going to show you how you can implement your own property-based tester in one afternoon or get started with existing tools <coughs> and give you a quick idea of what tools already exist. So why do you want to test it all? Reliability, interoperability, so your code doesn't break, so it doesn't break in the same way again and <coughs> again and so forth, but this is the testing room, so Hopefully I don't really have to convince anyone here that testing is a good idea. And why property-based testing specifically, as opposed to unit testing or formal proofs or anything else? Well, writing tests by hand is really slow and really boring and it's really fragile and almost no projects actually end up with reasonable test coverage that way. Well, if you can generate the test cases instead, you get more tests, more code coverage, and it's more flexible and more fun. And computers are pretty good at coming up with test cases that humans might not because they're too big or too strange. So a show of hands, who here has written a set of unit tests and then had to change them all by hand as your code changed? Okay, that's <coughs> probably 80% of us here. And who thought that, who thought that was fun? Okay, one of you, maybe. <laughs> oh. Okay, he's joking too. And it's a lot faster and a lot easier to just change one little bit of code generation and have that automatically running a bunch of updated tests instead. So what is property-based testing? The idea is that you have some property, and there's some examples on the slide, and you want that property to always be true, no matter what input you give it. So you might have some function that takes a couple of arguments and should always have a result less than 100, for instance. Or if you've implemented a stable sorting algorithm, then if you sort the results, they should be the same as if you just sorted it once. Or if you have something that you're optimizing, you should probably get the same result before and after you've optimized it, and if not, there's probably something pretty wrong. Or you could be testing your application against an older version of itself or another application that does the same thing and you might want to see that they have the same result without writing 10,000 tests to do that by hand. And property-based testing is a way of saying, here's this property, throw a bunch of stuff at it and tell me if it goes wrong or not. There's some things that property-based testing is not. It's not the same thing as formal proofs or formal methods in general. It's not generally exhaustive. If you've got a Boolean or maybe like one, a or maybe an ASCII character, it'll exhaustively test your state space with enough tests. But in general, if you're even dealing with say 32-bit integers or strings, you're going to test a few cases, not absolutely everything. So it's not exhaustive and what it does instead is it throws random test cases at your property and tries to find something that makes it false. If you find something that makes it false, excellent, you found a problem. If you're lucky, it's even a problem in your code and not in your test cases. And if it's a problem in your test cases, at least they're still easy to fix without having to change a lot of different stuff. And so if you don't find any counterexamples, well, you can keep running it, but you have a little more confidence that that part of your code is doing what you want in the same way that you would if you'd written a lot of unit tests for it. And you might wonder why not to, why not test exhaustively? Because 
it would be great to know that your program did exactly the right thing for every single input. Problem is that basically, in general, you can't. It's too difficult, too expensive. If you've got, say, three 32-bit numbers, you've already got whatever four billion to the third um, number of possibilities is. If you've got a program that shockingly deals with more than three integers, the problem is worse. And while there are ways of trying to deal with this with state space reduction, whatever informal methods research, there's a research in that for a reason. And in general, that's not something easy to get started with. And it often isn't tractable for real programs. So property-based testing sits nicely in the middle. You end up testing more than with unit tests and testing more things than you would with unit tests. But you can still start with it in an afternoon and actually get results. And the case study for today is what happened uh, when we threw property-based testing at Egelia's um, compiler, Pioflua. Pioflua is a source-to-source -source compiler, which takes libpcap's filter language, which at Egalia we call pflang, and emits uh, code in the programming language called Lua. And it does that because it allows us to run the Lua code through LuaJIT, which is a really, really fast implementation of Lua. Aside from having way shorter, way clearer code than libpcap, we also run a lot faster. And PFLU is available on GitHub, and it's available with the version two of the Apache license. To give you an idea, here is um, the performance of libpcap in green versus um, PFLUA in orange on six different filters. <coughs> as you can see, PFLUA is often around twice as fast or better. It's also faster than Linux BPF and Linux EPPF and so forth, and we're pretty happy with that. But on top of it being fast, we want it to actually work. And when we started doing this testing, it seemed to work, and we had tests already. And there were two forms of testing when we decided to do this. And just as an aside, pflang is um, the input language for pflu and libpcap and other tools. If anyone knows of an official name for it, I'd love to hear about it. But since, as far as uh, Gelia knows, it doesn't have a name, we call it pflang because it's useful to be able to refer to it. If you've ever used Wireshark or TCP dump, you've used it. So when I started at Egalia, I looked at the testing of it and said, OK, we have tests. This is good. Let's add property-based tests. And Andy Wingo said, OK. And so we decided to sit down and write a property-based tester, which we did in one afternoon with one property, which was, OK, here's the intermediate representation of our program. Let's throw our optimizer at it and then test the optimized and unoptimized versions against a random packet and see if they both match it or both don't match it. And if they don't, then we have a bug. And doing that on this working tested code, we found six bugs that afternoon. And with the same stuff later on, we actually found a seventh as well, several of which we were unlikely to find by testing by hand. And again, this is on a working tested project in one afternoon with our own tool, which has some, some, uh, which has some serious limitations, which I'll talk about in later slides. If you're using an existing tool and giving it an afternoon, you're likely to get even better results. So probably our funniest bug was uh, that we were accidentally emitting comments. P.F. Lang kind of allows you to have negative numbers. And so we were having code like 8 um, minus minus 2 in our Lua, which sounds reasonable, except with no spaces, it's like using a slash slash in uh, C or C++ or a hash in Python. It's a comment. So 8 dash dash 2 is 8 rather than 10. And we also had an invalid optimization bug. And these two were both pretty serious because it would silently give you the wrong answer. And finding bugs like that early before you actually have to track them down 
in a gigantic real world use case is really, really helpful. Aside from that, we found four other bugs that at least would cause crashes at some point. So they were somewhat less serious, but we were still glad to find them. And the seventh bug, which we only really looked into properly later, turned out to be a bug in LuaJIT or itself. <coughs> it was not doing exactly the right thing with random numbers. And that was giving us problems with test case repe repeatability. And we probably wouldn't have found that without these tests. And so even with tested projects, there are some parts that you tend not to test as much as you would ideally want to. We didn't have any tests for range analysis and with <coughs> property-based testing, not of the range analysis itself, but of the intermediate representation, we found three bugs in it. And in typical use, we weren't seeing any problems, but they were there and they were just waiting to get more complicated input to find them. <coughs> and to give you an idea of exactly how little time it takes to get started with property-based testing, we also fixed four of the bugs that we found the same afternoon. It's not that property-based testing took up the whole afternoon, it didn't. So how does property-based testing work? You have a loop, you generate test cases, and you run the test case with your property. It's basically three lines of code conceptually. In practice, you'll wanna do things like handle exceptions. And if you've got a pre-made tool, you basically just enter your property. And if you've got a complicated test type, something to let that be generated randomly. But that's really all there is to it. Generating test cases, if you're using an existing tool such as QuickCheck for say an integer type is entirely automatic. If you've got a more complicated type, like the abstract syntax tree of the compiler, which is what we were generating, it looks something more like this. We uh, used a functional grammar and so we had uh, a function called logical, which would walk a tree essentially, <coughs> well, no, actually that's makes it sound too complicated. We'd randomly choose to have that generate something like say true, which is at the top and uh, just would be the string true, which was our ASP for it. Alternatively, it would do something like choose to generate a comparison. And so it would get a comparison op, like say less than, and then two arith arithmetic expressions, which would be numbers or some simple thing like three plus four or something along those lines. And so the whole code for generating random ASPs was about half a page long. One thing that you might be wondering at this point is are unweighted uh, choices really enough? And the answer to that is yes and no. Yes in that even with them you will find a lot of bugs. No in that you can really easily do a lot better. For instance, let's say that you've got a 32-bit integer and your property is that one divided by y is less than or equal to y. That's only true if y is zero. And if you're running say 10,000 random test cases, you may well never come across a zero. And so can anyone think of some other common numbers that end up being edge cases surprisingly often? Yeah, as people are saying, <laughs> the max number in a range is often uh, quite evil in this regard as well. Middle of the range can be interesting as well, especially if you've got some potential signed and unsigned issues. One ends up being an interesting case surprisingly often if someone handles zero and two plus, but not one. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, minus one can also be interesting if you've got signed uh, numbers. And implementing weighted choices is about equally simple. Here's how we did it that afternoon. We said, okay, 20% of the time, give us a random number. Otherwise, give us zero or one or maximum numbers. And 
so it doesn't really take much code to add some kind of voiding. And if you're wanting to write your own checker, here's essentially a slightly cleaned up version of what we of the core part of what we wrote that afternoon. It uh, chooses a random packet and makes a random abstract syntax tree, compiles it, optimizes it, compiles the optimized version, sees uh, if the results of both are equal, and if it doesn't, it prints out some details and dies horribly. And if you're going to do something like this, you can just hard code your property into a main loop, and it really only is about this much code. Of course, doing it this way has a few drawbacks. One is that you get really hideous test cases. A lot of our test cases ended up being about five pages long if you print them out. Trying to analyze those wouldn't be fun. On the bright side, we were using Lua, so we got backtraces as well, and with the backtraces, we got to pretty much ignore the test data. We were lucky in that regard. And another problem with doing it this naively is that it actually randomly searches the solutions space. So 20% of our tests were checking that false was still false. That sounds bad. On the other hand, about 40% of our tests weren't trivial, and we were running with a default of 1,000 tests. So every time we would run this, we were getting 400 non-trivial test cases in about one second, which kind of mitigates the badness a bit. But again, it can be worth using an existing tool so you don't have that problem. One of the more interesting things that uh, comes up as an end user of property-based testing is what level you want to test things at. So for a compiler, do you want to test the front-end language that it comes in, or do you want to test various levels of intermediate representation? Or for things that aren't compilers, do you want to test your input, whatever that is, or do you want to test various bits of internal state? And there are some serious trade-offs there. On uh, one hand, white box testing with internals can be a really useful way to do things, but on the other hand, it's more fragile. Although, like I said earlier, it's a lot easier to bring up to date than trying to do this with unit tests by hand. And another detail is that um, white box uh, testing of internals can be tricky because your front end might only generate some subset of what it theoretically could, and you could have trouble making test cases that reflect that. So you can find data that breaks your back end, but that your front end doesn't generate. And for small projects, you can decide what you want to do about that. For larger projects, like say LLVMs, that makes testing various parts of the middle end much less feasible. But you can still test the front end at that point. And another thing to bear in mind is that testing at multiple levels is possible. You can test your front end and also intermediate states. And if you don't do that and you only test your input, it's still surprisingly useful because you'll be generating enough inputs that you'll be testing quite a lot of edge cases within the lower levels as well. So for instance, with our case study, we were testing the abstract syntax tree, but we found three bugs in the range checker, or sorry, in the range analysis. And so you'll tend to find quite a lot of bugs in the lower levels with this approach, even if you only test at the higher levels. And as I was hinting at a moment ago, interfaces change. You're probably not going to be compiling C one day and Lua the next, or taking one type of input one day and something entirely different the next. So at the front end, that's less of an issue, but the internals of your program can change, especially if you refactor heavily. And so that does mean updating tests. And even with property-based testing, that takes some effort, though a lot less than with unit tests. And Aside from this, property-based testing really, really is a boon for refactoring because it gives you surprisingly good coverage if you choose a good property. 
And so you'll notice more quickly if your change has broken everything and you'll have reasonably decent test coverage without having a gigantic group of handwritten tests that you have to change by hand all of the time. So in that area, it has a really nice set of trade-offs. All of that said, it's still worth unit testing. Property-based testing is good for finding new bugs and even for finding classes of bugs in your program. But if you're going to randomly search this gigantic space that you might have some problems in, you're not necessarily going to be checking the same part of that space over and over again. So having unit tests is useful if you want to avoid known regressions that you're only triggering rarely, for instance. And unit tests are also very useful if uh, generating tests is infeasible. For instance, if it's down a particularly rare path that you can only trigger every once in a while, or if you've got something which is too fragile to really generate in a way that your system can use it, probably at some intermediate level of um, internals of your program. One other issue with this is having reproducible tests. <coughs> the way that most property-based testers, including the one we wrote in afternoon work, is by having a random seed and then outputting that so that you can rerun the same tests and trigger the same faults. Problems with that include portability. The RNG might not produce the same results across different platforms or be stable across upgrades. And sometimes bugs in your compiler or interpreter or libraries can hinder reproducibility. And this shows up slightly more often than you would think in practice. We ran into it. We ended up having to upgrade uh, Luajit, which was our seventh bug, because of a problem with this. And if I've convinced you that property-based testing is a good idea, but you don't want to have to write your own property-based tester by hand, there are existing tools. The most widely known and widely used is uh, QuickCheck, which is a bit over 15 years old now. It was originally in Haskell, but it's been ported to quite a few other languages by now. And it has better tools for test case generation and allows you to filter test cases. For instance, you might only be interested in testing strings that are, are at least five characters long. And it starts with relatively small test cases, so you don't end up with gigantic monstrous, uh, monstrous test cases by default. And as a quick check to which is also quite old by now. It has test case minimization, so it'll try to give you the smallest test case it can for <coughs> any given bug it finds. And that is really, really helpful, especially if a backtrace doesn't provide enough information to fix the bug by itself. And on top of that, you can do even better than quick check. I think the future of test case uh, generation is probably in tools like Hypothesis, which is by David uh, Ritchie McKeever and is available on GitHub. And it uses a database of examples instead of saving seeds, which allows it to keep uh, interesting examples around to use between tests. And it has much um, smarter data generation, so it tries to search bits of the state space that you tell it are interesting instead of just randomly searching somewhere in it. And it adapts to conditional tests, like say strings more than five characters in a somewhat more intelligent way as well. And it tries to blur the line between fuzz testing, conventional unit testing, and property-based testing. And it's under quite active development. The author hopes to have a 1.0 release out around the end of February but he's planning to add things like adding uh, coverage information to drive example generation so you get even better coverage than you would with an entirely random tool and as well as better integration with continuous integration tools. And right now it's quite underdocumented, but if anyone ends up getting really captured by the idea of property-based testing and its power, I would recommend taking a look at it now or taking a look at it 
in February or March when it's a little bit more mature. If you want other stable tools that do some of the same things, even better than quick check, it could be worthwhile looking at, say, Scala check, which is already mature and widely used and does some quite interesting things in generating interesting random test cases. So, in conclusion, property-based testing finds some really tricky bugs and it can save you a lot of time. If you find a bug early, it's a lot better than finding the same bug 10 months later when you're having to dig through a gigantic thing from a customer in the field. You can start doing it in an afternoon with no tools. You could probably start doing it in an hour with no tools, really. And if you're willing to spend a little bit of time reading a manual, then using something like QuickCheck can save you a lot of time and help you make really effective test cases really quite quickly. And I would recommend that you start property-based uh, property testing today, or since it's Monday, and since we're still at Boston, on Monday at least. And does anyone have any questions? Okay. Yes, uh, okay, so the question was, are we still using it with PF Lua and have we found any more bugs with it or was it just the original set? And the answer is yes, we're constantly using it. Uh, we've integrated it uh, with our continuous integration stuff. We're using the free version of uh, Travis for projects on GitHub since this is all open source stuff and we can and it works pretty well. And so we are running these tests uh, frequently and they have helped us uh, track down other bugs. They've uh, negged us about the two bugs that we didn't fix that afternoon. We got around to fixing those last week and it didn't let us forget about them in the meanwhile. And it also helped us find a bug in LuaJIT, which we solved by upgrading LuaJIT. And again, that was last week. And it also reminds us when we've got some change that needs um, fixing and in general, it's being constantly useful. And in the meanwhile, we've added a bit more than an afternoon of hacking and it deals with multiple properties by now. And that's helped us work out some bugs with the fact that Lua uses doubles, so 64-bit floats, and uh, pflang and libpcap use 32-bit unsigned integers, which they also fake signed integers by in various interesting ways. And uh, we had some interesting, interesting compatibility issues with that. And we have property-based tests that show us that we've probably worked that stuff out by now. Um, okay, over there. Okay, so the questions um, were things like whether it gets impractical for a large number of tests. That depends on how expensive your tests are. We run a thousand tests in about one second, so we haven't had that problem. If you have an expensive unit-based test suite that's needing to do a lot of setting up things in expensive ways, then your tests are going to be more expensive in general. If you have a system factored in a way where you can test a lot of parts relatively independently and have some more expensive uh, integration tests as well on the side, it's more tractable. That depends a lot on your system architecture. Um, was there another part to your question too? Yeah, okay, so it was really about whether the tests are small enough to run them really quickly. And that could be an issue. It's not an issue we've had, and it really just depends on how much the cost of running one test on that thing is. 
I mean, on my very cheap, very low spec um, netbook, it takes about one second to run a thousand tests. Yes, you can run a random subset of them. At that point, it becomes very important to have better random testing than uh, we do, because right now, 60% of our tests are pretty much the same thing over and over again, but it's the 40% that makes it worthwhile, and since they're taking a second to run, fixing it hasn't been a high priority. Okay, um, yep. I believe that there is, okay, yeah. Um, he's asking if there's a good property-based testing tool in Ruby. I believe, but I'm not absolutely certain that there's a port of quick check to Ruby. And, okay, I've been told by a guy at the front that there is. And hopefully it's a good one. I've seen some really good quick, <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some really good quick check ports and some really bad quick check ports. Uh, if, if you have any trouble finding one, email me and I'll see if I can hunt one up. Um, Luca, do you know the name? Rentley. Sorry, what? Rentley. Rentley? Apparently it's called uh, Rentley. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, we found one on GitHub. We failed to get it working in about five minutes and uh, an invented here, or not invented here syndrome kind of kicked in at that point. Um, um, no, we've decided for the moment not to release this as a library because it's very specific to our tool and uh, it doesn't add much beyond what anyone else could do in an afternoon. Where, <coughs> yeah, um, basically what we're planning to do with that is keep an eye on the existing tools, keep building it up, and if we get it full featured enough to a point where we think it would actually be useful to other people, we would release it on its own. Well, right now, it's about that much code, and it's available in, in our repository if you're really curious, but it's not a standalone tool. And um, what's your question? Okay, so the uh, question is, uh, does this work well for numerical testing and not just for DSL-like stuff? And I would say yes, although the caveats about it being important to test edge cases are, uh, again, very important there. I've been using quick check every once in a while for, I don't know, over a decade at this point for all sorts of things from data structures to whatever random small thing I happen to feel like testing that way and it's pretty uniformly useful I find. Okay, um, what's your question? Okay, the question is whether hypothesis is a variant of quick check or completely different. Um, I would say it's a sort of a descendant of quick check via Scala check. Um, so Scala check sort of expands on quick check in terms of uh, how t smart it tries to be about generating test cases. And hypothesis is relatively directly inspired by that, but tries to take it a bit further. Um, does that kind of answer your question? Okay, and then the question is whether it's called hypothesis because you can give hints about what kind of example to generate. And yes, it is. It uses a branch of math uh, that talks about multi-armed bandits all the time. I'm not personally familiar with this branch particularly well, but it's a relatively well-established branch of math. The guy behind it uh, did a math degree at Cambridge. Um, so if you have questions about the math, um, I think I'll have to direct you to him, unfortunately. And what's your question? <coughs> were we using, uh, generating, or sorry, were we using properties of our program to generate better use cases? I would say 
No, not really. What we were doing is saying, for pretty much anything you can throw at it, does it do what we want? At that point, with any use case that the existing program has, it should be fine because we won't have a bunch of bugs lurking in the ones that we haven't tested yet because we have tested them. And then if we add new use cases, we can add more properties because the thing with property-based testing is that you can have a lot of different properties uh, for a lot of different use cases or for a lot of different parts of the system and then you end up changing like this much code when you add something new. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.